Good morning. Good morning. I was reading an article about God's timing and stuff. And there's a joke in there. A uh, man's woman went on a tour of Europe. And she stopped, at her first stop, she gets to England and she calls back. And she asks him, well, how's everything going? And he says, well, cat fell off the roof, roof and is dead. And she said, well, that, why would you say something that abruptly? He said, what do you mean? She said, well, your timing is terrible saying things like that. She said, you could have said, when I was in England, you could say the cat's dead. And then when I got to France, you could say the cat fell. And then when I got to Italy, you could say, well, the cat's not doing well. And then when I get to Spain, you could say the cat's dead. She said, your timing is horrible. And she said, well, how's my mother doing? And he said, well, she's on the roof. <laughs> Sometimes God's timing is way different than ours. Things that we want to happen don't happen. They don't happen as soon as we want them. We pray for things. We may not get the answer immediately. I want to talk a little bit about God's timing, especially God's timing in relationship to the season we're in here. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Father God, I just thank you so much. I thank you so much for all that are gathered here and for those that can't gather and might be watching. Lord, I thank you that we can share your word that we can share your, your story and your message, Lord, and the hope that we have for our future. Father, just uh, give me the words that you want spoken as we go forward. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in honor of Jackie, who complained to me the other day. Oh! Goodness. There's my granddaughter and my grandson, but she was saying, you got lots of pictures of your grandson up and every granddaughter. Well... That vest and, and bow tie and dress and the little bonnet were all made by Jane. She Aww. made that. She sewed all that for them and, wow. when she got a, got a chance to go visit them. Well, let's talk a little bit about God's timing. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9 says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter gets this concept right off the bat. And sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our brain around that for God, a thousand years is like one day. And one day is like a thousand years. We think linearly. We think chronologically. Anytime somebody tells you a story, they start at the beginning and the end at the end because our brain can comprehend that. God's story doesn't start at the beginning and end at the end. It's eternal. So it's a lot different than the way we look at things. I want to give you an example here. We're going to go into Luke, and we'll, we'll start with the first example. This is John the Baptist's birth in Luke 1. Okay? Luke 1, 13 through 18. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, the disobedience and the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Well, the angel, when he's talking to him, he mentions the promise. He says, your prayers have been answered. They have no children. And now they're old. I'm sure they've been praying for children since their marriage. They've been praying for a very long time. And the angel says, oh, your prayer's answered. I'm sure Zachariah is like, oh, which one? We're too old for this. That's amazing. I, I love the next passage. I didn't put it up here. But immediately after Zachariah, Zachariah says, well, how can I be sure of this? Gabriel, who's speaking to him, says, I'm Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. You're going to keep your mouth shut till the baby's born. You talk about this, laugh about this, okay, we'll shut you off. But this is one of those things where God's timing is perfect, because John the Baptist came when John the Baptist needed to be here. It happened exactly the way it was supposed to happen. All of these things were foretold, all of these things were prophecy, and they all were fulfilled here. But when John the Baptist was conceived and born... It was a shock. The timing was odd. It was weird. Everybody around him would have said, boy, this is a strange pregnancy. Elizabeth goes into uh, seclusion for five months and comes out and meets Mary and 
That's where the Holy Spirit was already in the baby, and he's jumping for joy in her, in her womb. This is strange timing. It's not the only strange timing in Luke, though. Let's look at the next one here. we got Mary. Okay, Mary is, uh, biblically we figure she's 14 or 15 years old. She is unmarried, but she's engaged. And now she's going to get pregnant. <coughs> Bad timing? Culturally, yes, because she could have been stoned and killed for it. Bad timing for everybody involved. It could have happened somewhere else, and somebody could sit down and say, well, God, why didn't you make it easier and all these kind of things? To Mary's credit, she said, your will be done. But here's what it says in Luke 1, 30 through 34. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Again, not the best timing in our eyes. When we look at it, it's not the best timing. And a lot of things in our lives are like that, aren't they? A lot of times things come and you say, well, yeah, this would have been better sooner or later when something happens. But it's only through 2020 hindsight that we get to look back and see that God did it right. We, we get a chance to look backwards in our lives. And I can look backward in my life and I can see a lot of things that happened that I either didn't expect or I didn't expect to come so late or all sorts of things like that happening. Things that I didn't expect that I would have said the timing was bad and now I look back and say, no, actually the timing was perfect. Yeah. That worked out just fine. That's the way it was supposed to be. Mary accepts this as a 14-year-old kid. There's not a whole lot of 14-year-old kids that have patience anymore. This is pretty special that this young lady would say this. Your will be done. But the timing probably wasn't exactly what she would have asked for either. Now the third one I want to talk about here is Bethlehem. This whole thing we're talking about, we've got our little manger scene here, all that kind of stuff. Talk about bad timing there. We have a very young teenage mom about to give birth, and they got to pick up and travel. Well, that, that's not something you would plan. That's not something you would hope for. That's not something you would say, oh, yeah, that's no big deal. It's a big deal. It's a very big deal. But, as it says here in Luke 2, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. I always think about Mary's mother when I think about timing. I'm sure she didn't understand the timing of Mary getting pregnant. And now her pregnant teenage daughter and her husband are going to be leaving when the baby's born. And he would grandma in here say, oh yeah, that's fine. We'll just see him when you get back. Oh, yeah, we're going to take off for Egypt after that for a while, and you won't see your grandson for quite a while. That's probably not the timing that Mary's mother would have liked. You would think that at home they're prepared, they're ready. People she knows, the midwife she knows, all those things are there. Now we're going to go somewhere else and with people we don't necessarily know. But that was God's timing, too. It was fulfillment of prophecy, and in addition to that, when they left Nazareth and they went to Bethlehem, it started to open people's eyes to this king following in the line of David, all the prophecy coming together. And from there, from Bethlehem, when they went to Egypt, it was easier. All these things lined up. They fell in place where, from our human perspective, if we were there at the time, it wouldn't make any sense at all. God's timing was perfect. I want to talk a little bit about the birth of Christ. Why did Jesus come then? We look into the Old Testament and we see Going all the way back to Genesis, we have the prophecy of, the, of Christ's coming. All the way through the Old Testament, we get it over and over and over again. Why did it happen when it happened? Well, a lot of things were going on in the world at the time that made it the perfect time for Christ to come. First of all, again, the Roman occupation of Israel, the Roman Empire, 
Not something that people would look at and say, well, that's a good thing. It's good that Jesus came when the Romans were in charge. Ask the Jewish people at the time, no. No, they didn't want the Romans there. But the Roman Empire was kind of special because it was very tolerant of other religions. The, the basic Roman statement was, because they took over so many different cultures, they said, you worship whoever you want, as long as you agree that Caesar is God. But there's only one culture that said, nah, to that. We're not going to do that. So an exception was made in the Roman Empire for the Jews. They said the Jews are too stubborn, so we won't make them say that. But we will tolerate their religion. And they did. When they were tolerating their religion, they did something very special for Christianity. The Romans connected Christianity and Judaism. They thought it was an offshoot of Judaism. So while they're tolerating Judaism, they also tolerated Christianity right up until 70 A.D. That's a good head start for the gospel to be moving. Yeah. In addition, the Romans built 50,000 miles of road. 50,000 miles of road within the Roman Empire. So when Paul's traveling to Damascus, he's on a Roman road. When they're traveling all throughout Spain and Turkey and all those areas we hear about in Acts, they either went in a ship that was protected by the Roman Navy so there were no pirates, or they were on a Roman road. When that uh, Ethiopian gets out of his chariot, you, you're not driving a chariot except on a road. When he gets baptized by Philip, that's on a Roman road. Those things were necessary for all this to happen. In addition, they have something called the Pax Romana. Now, the Roman Empire, this is the, here's the history teacher of me coming up. The Roman Empire had gone through a lot of civil wars. When Julius Caesar was killed, they went through a lot of civil wars, a lot of upset, and a lot of terrible things going on. And the Roman Empire was really in turmoil. And it wasn't peaceful. In 25 BC, the Pax Romana started, and that was 200 years of peace in the Roman Empire. 200 years of stability where things weren't changing. Again, this is when Christ comes, and this is when Christ's ministry happens, and this is when the, the uh, apostles go out and start spreading the word. This happens during this time period. <coughs> the other thing that happened that lined up pretty good with Jesus here, according to the works with God's plan, is Alexander the Great had gone through and conquered. And the Macedonian, who's Greek, he went through and, and went all the way to, to uh, the borders of India. When Alexander the Great went there, he spread the Greek culture. And because the Greek culture had covered all of this land, people learned Greek. And in learning Greek, they learned how to read it, and how to write it, and how to speak it. Because that was the business language at the time. You remember where Israel is? The Mediterranean Sea is right there. All of those things going on. Any trade going on is going to be done in Greek. That's the trade language. More people were able to read and write at the, at the time of Jesus than ever before in history. It wasn't just scholars that were reading and writing. Everybody was reading and writing Greek because it had come through the Greek culture. So because of this, we have our New Testament written in Greek that could go from country to country to country but the Greek was similar. Right now, if something was written in the United States you could, and the only thing you spoke was English, we'd hit England and Ireland and uh, Canada. But English is spoken everywhere. Australia. But English is spoken a lot of different places now. It's, so we don't see it as such a big deal. Huge. Huge. And at that time, Greek was possible to be passed around. Paul wrote letters the letters of the New Testament, when Paul wrote the letters to Philippi, and he wrote it to Colossians, and he wrote to Romans, all of those letters were written in one language and sent to different places, and they all understood it. When John put down read the book of Revelations, he put it down in what, in this, in this time period, was a universal language. So why was Jesus born at this time? Because world history, God had lined everything up in world history to make it work just perfect. At the time, nobody would have said the Roman Empire was a, was a blessing or a benefit, but it was. And maybe that's why God blessed the Roman Empire enough to get that big, even though they weren't Christian, because he said, we need some roads later on. God's timing is much different than ours. A lot of different things happen. 
And a lot of that is mysterious to us. We don't understand it. And the real mystery, the biggest mystery to me, God gives us free will. And yet he works everything to our good. What you do, God can take and make something out of it. That's amazing to me. It, it, it's a, it seems like a contradiction, but it's, it's beyond what I can understand. We had a, Jane and I had a blessing Friday night to go to a concert on Rapid City. And uh, the two different guys that were leading the, the bands that were there, both of them gave their testimony. And the one that just stuck with me, the first guy that came up, it stuck with me. He said, God took my mess and made it my message. The life that I was leading, the things that I was doing now are my message out. I can, I can take what was trash and show you what the treasure God made out of it. Things don't go necessarily the way we want it, but just understand that they're going the way God wants it. Other examples of God's timing that wouldn't make sense? Joseph, most favored son of his father, sold off into Egypt. How terrible is that? All the terrible things he went through. He's doing good for a while. Then he's Potiphar's wife accuses him of doing other things. He gets thrown into prison. But because he's in prison, the Pharaoh figures out that he can interpret dreams and makes him important. All of those things happen so that the same people that sold him into slavery would then be saved later on. God's timing. Not what we would pick. I'm sure not what Joseph would have picked for himself, but that's the way it worked. Another one that I have up here is David. Shepherd boy. Youngest of his family. A nobody. And all the things that happened in David's life. And the last one I put up here was Esther. And Esther was very special. And she has, there's, there's this passage in Esther uh, 4 verse 14 from her <coughs> uncle who's talking to her. And this is the perfect thing about timing. It says, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. He tells her, you know what? God's will is going to be done whether you do it or not. But you have the opportunity. God puts you in the perfect position to be the one to have the effect that needs to happen. God will do it anyway. But here's your chance. And he said, maybe you're here at this time for this reason. Why are we here at this time? We talk a lot about our society and the things that are going around and, and the, the things in the news and all the different stuff going on. And we're living in the middle of that. As a kid, I always wanted to live back in the 1800s. I wanted to live, I wanted to live mountain man or cowboy time. I, the Westerns, reading, growing up reading Louis L'Amour, you didn't want to live here. You wanted to live there. That's not where God wants us. God wanted us right where we are right now, right here. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. He has a plan for us in the society, in the place that we are living right now. Looking back in 2020 hindsight, I never pictured myself here. Standing in the front of this church. I never pictured myself in Dupree. I never pictured myself in South Dakota. I never pictured myself on the reservation. None, none of those things. And every one of those things are challenges. Every single part of that is a challenge. But God put us there for that challenge. Jan, growing up in Blue Earth as a little kid, just never went, I really want to live on a ranch in South Dakota. And never go to town. She never said that. But that's where God put her, and look what's happened because of it. All of these things have fallen into place. And again, with that 2020 hindsight, we can see where God's fingerprint was on it all the way along. We made a decision, and here it comes. Here, here we get pushed in the direction God wants us to go. That's all part of that mystery again. So, Paul writes in Galatians about the fullness of time. What, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the time, set time had fully come, God sent his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. There were an awful lot of people that had prophecies of Jesus and never saw him. There was an awful lot of prophets that knew exactly what was going to happen and didn't live until it did. We have been blessed at this point in this time where we are that we get to look back on 2020 hindsight and see all the things God tied together to make this happen. But it's that fullness of time I want you to notice. If God in the fullness of time at the exact right time made all the things possible and sent his son for that purpose, why would he not do the same thing in your life? In your life, God's timing is perfect the same way. So let's talk a little bit about application here again. I'm always going to application. The mystery of God's timing is here. Proverbs 16, 9 says, In their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. You can make the best made plans. What's that, what's that old saying? The best made plans of mice and men? We don't think that mice are worth much, but I'm sure they have plans on something too, just like we do. And if we're just the same as them. God is in control, not us. In addition, Ecclesiastes 3 1 says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And that season is not dictated by us. We have free will, but God is still directing our path. So how do you apply this in your life? Well, the first thing we look at is the fact that we need to have hope. Understand that no matter the circumstances, God's at work and he is guiding so if you feel like you are a ship without a rudder floating around, God's still guiding you. We don't have to worry about those things. We have hope because of that. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 12 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. Talk about hope. God says, I got plans for you. You might not have plans for yourself. I talked to a lot of these kids at school, these kids at high school. And what does everybody ask a senior in high school that they never really know? What are you going to do? do? What are you going to do after you get out of school? Most of them, if they're honest, will say, I don't know. I got no idea. <coughs> well, I'm going to Black Hill State. What for? I don't know because it's the next thing to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. They have no idea where their life is going to take them. That's a joy. That's a blessing because it's exciting to find out what happens next. People do different things. I, like I said, I never planned on being here. Cooper, what did you go to school for? <laughs> Heating and cooling. Is that heater working over here yet? Yeah. I'll throw that out there. Okay. <laughs> but that, do, you want to, do you want to just give everything up and go fix furnaces for a living? Absolutely not. That's not where God took him. But where, where he went initially. So we have plans and we try and make things happen. We try and put them together. We try, we try and make something. We, we plan our, our plans. We dream our dreams. We try and do it. And God says, okay, now let me guide you this way. And I'm going to guide you this way. Things are going to change. If you look back in your life, you will see those fingerprints where God's given you the little nudges you need. We need to believe in that, hope in that. The second application is we need to wait. That's hard. God's timing sometimes is hard. It's hard to wait and have patience. But understanding that the hope we have, the one we just last talked to, we need to pray about it and wait patiently. We just talked about Zachariah and Elizabeth. And Gabriel comes to him and says, your prayers have been answered. I know you've been praying for 60 years, but hey, boom, here's your answer. You know, I, Jane and I don't play the lottery, but I make her send in all the publishers' clearinghouse stuff. Jane says she does it to make sure Mary Lou stays in business. Because they send you stuff constantly then. We get lots of stuff in the mail. What would happen if, if it fell, if it happened and those things, I don't know. We have all sorts of, well, if suddenly we got blessed with all that money, what would we do with it? We got ideas. We got thoughts. God's will be done. If it never comes, God's still taking care of us. That's not a big deal. But what we need to be doing while we're waiting for that answer to our prayer, 
while we're waiting for the solution to the problems we might have. When Jane and I were down in Blunt, um, we had a perfect storm of negative things happen to us, one after another after another. Um, we didn't realize when we bought our place that we were on a floodplain, and the flood insurance took us beyond what we could make our payments. And then, and then it flooded, and we had almost four feet of water in the basement. Um, the sewer, the, the septic tank backed up into the basement. We had all sorts of issues, all sorts of things going on. And at the time, we had no idea what's going to happen next. And it's hard to wait for God to answer the prayers to fix things. He did. We came here. In the end, that house is now owned by somebody else. We drove by and we went to that funeral a couple weeks ago. Owned by somebody else who's, who's treating it right. I hand built a barn and all sorts of stuff down there. They got cows, they got horses, they got all sorts of stuff in there. I remember building that barn literally by, I dug all the post holes by hand, hauled all the ties in by hand, put it out, Ryan helped me, we put every every little bolt and stuff was done on there. Um, and I think I had a cordless drill to put the roof on. Other than that, it was all hand tools. And when we left, I'm like, oh, I hope nobody tears this down. It's still standing and they're using it right. Somebody else is getting a fulfillment of what I thought was gonna be our dream. It's their place. I'm good with that. We need to learn to wait and understand that God says, I have plans for you, plans to make you prosper, plans to give you what you want, even if you don't know what you want yet. I will give you things that you don't know that you need. You ask me for things, that's great. Sometimes you get what you, what you ask for, and sometimes you don't, because that's not part of his plan. But we need to wait patiently to see what God's going to do next. And I think about Mary. In these nativity scenes we always have, what's Mary doing? Every time. We never have a nativity scene where she's holding the baby. I always thought that was interesting. Most mothers will not let go. But Jesus is in the manger and she's on her knees looking at her child. What do you think is going through her mind? What's next for this baby? An angel came and told me who he was. How's this going to happen? What's going to happen next? What's he going to be like when he grows? What's it going to be like for me as a mother? And if you read in your, if you read your Bible, it'll say, Mary gathered all these things up and pondered them in her heart. She didn't know what the future was. I'm sure she prayed for all sorts of positive things to happen. Herod sends soldiers out to kill all the baby boys that are born in Bethlehem, two years old and under. They, they take off to Egypt. What's going to happen with my son? How is this following what God wants us to do? All those things, I'm sure, are going through her head. She has no idea where God's going to take this ministry, where God's going to, what God's going to do with his son. I'm sure she's praying. And I'm sure that never in her prayers did she say, please crucify my son. And yet she stood at the foot of the cross and watched but God's plan demanded that sacrifice. We have to wait for the answers. We may not understand it. <coughs> now the third application that I have here is that we need to lean in a little bit. If we have the hope and we're waiting patiently, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. All your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Don't lean on your own understanding. Every time we think we got it figured out, every time we think we can do it without God, we fail. Every time in my life when I've ever said, well, I'll just do it this way. I'm tired of waiting. It worked out very good. And I can look back on that and say, God taught me a lesson by not... not making me successful at times when I thought I had the answers. We need to lean on God. This time, it's it, these three things we talked about, hope, waiting, and leaning on God, all tie together. If we trust Him and we love Him and we know Him and we understand Him as our Father, we should be able to lean in and say, you know what, I don't know where this is going to take me, but I know you're with me, so 
I had a talk with uh, one of my power lifters and he talked about traveling from California to Bismarck when he was young. He's lived in a lot of different places they moved around. They did it on a Greyhound from California to Bismarck. Well, I went from St. John's University to Winona, Minnesota one, one year at Christmas time on a Greyhound. That is a about a two hour drive. It took nine hours on a bus. He said it took him two weeks to get from California to Bismarck, North Dakota. Living on a bus. <clears throat> he wasn't driving. He's not driving the bus. You just sit on the bus and it goes where it takes where it takes you. You can't make it go faster. You can't make time spin up any better. You can't make anything happen. You're just along for the ride. You buy your ticket, you go for the ride. Guess what? God's driving the bus. Whatever happens in the meantime, look back on it and see the blessings that happened because you waited. Look back on the things of the people that you have met because you had to wait. Because things didn't exactly line up the way you thought. And then you go, wow. Look where I am now. Look what I know now. Look what I've learned. It's hard for, for kids to understand these things. That this, this is going to happen in life. It's hard for them to understand that every experience you have is a lesson from God. Every person you make contact with is a blessing. Whether it's a positive contact or a negative contact, it'll still be a blessing in your life later on. You learn from that. God does all these things to teach us. And we need to lean into him and just say, you know what? You're driving. I'm just following. I am willing to go where you want to take me. Wherever that is, I'm willing to go where you take me. So when we look at God's timing, we look at these examples in the Bible, we look at Mary, we look at Joseph, we look at those people in the Bible and we say, wow, aren't they special? Aren't those exceptional people? Yes, they are. But you know what? So are you. All you have to do is lean in and let God take control and amazing things will happen. Amazing things will happen. Now, I had an evangelist call me this week from Sioux Falls. Um, Nothing set in stone. We're just talking right now, but he wants to do something out here. They used to run Life Light in Sioux Falls. I didn't know that they don't do that anymore. That big concert every year, they don't do those anymore. Um, but they've gone all over the world now doing evangelism. And he said God convicted him when he was overseas that he needs to go home. And he said, I need to, I need to be in South Dakota. And he said, I want to hit every single county in South Dakota. And he said, I looked you guys up. I did my research. You guys have a Bible-believing church, so I called you. I said, well, first of all, thank you. And he said, I'd like to do something that we'll just talk about. We talked about a bunch of things. He said, I'll, we'll be in touch, and we'll, we'll start looking at this. Now, he's going to come and do something. And he said, I've done missionary work. I've done this stuff all my life. He said, I want to do what you need in your community because I want your community to be blessed by contact with us. And I want it to be different and I want it to be something that lasts. And then we said, well, let's talk about this. See if we can figure out how to make all that stuff happen. There have been a lot of people that have crossed paths in this area. There are a lot of people with good intentions that have touched and gone. There's a lot of things that have happened in this community that did not stick. So we pray. And we keep praying. And I'm going to ask you with me to pray that we can come up with something through our church that can be done that will have a lasting effect on even one person's life. Just one would be awesome. Be an awesome thing. This concert Jane and I went to Friday, a um, guy named Zach Williams. We love his music. We've been listening to it for a long time. I played on guitar. Jane plays on piano. There's one particular song that she's leaned into. Leaned into God through the song. That Friday night, he said, there's, some of, there's somebody in this audience, there's some of you out there right now are waiting on God. He gave his testimony about how he wandered away and came back. And he said, there are parents in this audience that are praying for children that have wandered away and haven't come back yet. I want you to know God's listening to that. And he talked about his own parents and how they had done things like that. There's a lot of things that we're waiting on. We're waiting on Christ to come back. We're waiting on him 
right now, if he came back, that would be a blessing for all of us. That'd be a, that would be awesome. <coughs> but like Peter said in the very beginning, God's timing is not our timing, and he doesn't want anyone to perish. So right now, Jesus is not here. He hasn't come back yet. And we pray, and we wait patiently, and we lean into God for those that we know that are lost and need to come back. God's timing is perfect. We don't know. Jesus said himself, even he doesn't know. Only, only the Father knows when I'm coming back. And when he does, it will be the perfect time. Whenever that is, we can take, we can take comfort in that. But in the meantime, lean in. Wait patiently. Pray with the knowledge and the hope and the conviction that your prayers will be answered and God will guide you where you need to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have gotten together and studied your word, Lord. I take great comfort in your word where you said that you have great plans for all of us. You have plans for each and every person in this room, from the youngest to the oldest. You have plans for the rest of our lives. For every heartbeat that we have, you have plans, Lord. That is a comforting thing. And Lord, we fail sometimes, we fall sometimes, we stumble sometimes, and sometimes we forget that you're in charge. Sometimes we forget that we need to be patient. Things are coming. Lord, I just pray that you just fill us with your grace and your understanding. Remind us, Lord, bring those into our lives that can help us re remember these things, to live this way. Touch us with those verses that we need to see, we need to hear. Speak to us, Lord, when we really need to hear your voice. Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we celebrate your son's birth this season, as we always do. But Lord, I, I just pray that each of us can look at the timing, look at the miracle, look at the blessing that we have received through your son. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.